The Finger Lakes region of upstate New York is famous for summer fun and gourmet wines, but it's also famous for racing. At the foot of Lake Seneca lies the legendary road course, Watkins Glen International. Here in the final race of the inaugural season of the Grand American Road Racing Association, two standouts in the high-tech world of sports cars will go head-to-head -head in an attempt to claim the historic debut Grand Am title. The storyline on this day is all about championships. For road racing fans everywhere, the mere mention of Watkins Glen conjures up images of motorsports lore to rival that of Indianapolis or Daytona. But those tracks are man-made over. The sights and sounds of exotic machinery winding through the picturesque surroundings of the hills of the New York wine country is an image road racing traditionalists savor. And Watkins Glen has been satisfying this craving for half a century. The drivers who have graced the Glen with their talents read like an all-time roster of racing superstars don't recognize any of these faces, perhaps road racing is not your passion after all. Whether it was endurance racing, Formula One, or Can Am, Watkins Glen was its mecca in America. Put aside all those new 21st century circuits popping up here and there, what they may have in glitz and glamour, they lack in ambience and plain history. There's just something about hearing a Ferrari V12 echoing through the hills of Watkins Glen International. To those who understand, it's simply the Glen. The memories go beyond the bounds of the racetrack to the streets of Watkins Glen, which helped give birth to road racing in America. Welcome to the Bosch Sports Car Summerfest at the Glen. I'm Bob Varsha along with David Hobbs. How's it feel to be back at a track you raced so many times? David? Well, it really is an absolutely wonderful track. This has some of the best corners in road racing and also some of the best overtaking opportunities. This track was well designed and built. And we have a great championship battle on store. Let's get the details now, beginning with John Bisignano. DDA Tays and James Weaver have proven themselves to be winners and champions all over the world. They've come to head to head many times, and why should it be any different in the Grand American Championship that started way back in Daytona last February and has come down here to a beautiful August afternoon at Watkins Glen. DDA Tays, the man with the most to do here, DDA, to take that championship today, you're going to have to have a perfect car, a perfect drive, a lot of luck, and the right strategy. Can you pull it off? Well, uh, a win and a perfect car is not enough. I need to have James uh, break something, and uh, especially early in the race, uh, because it's 16 points between him and me, and uh, that's, uh, that will be like around 10 or 12 cars. And, uh, you know, even if I win and James finish second, it's not enough. Well, best of luck with everything you need. James, it's been a great season. You've proven yourself a winner many times over. All you have to do is go 90 minutes in this race, and you are the champion. How do you feel about it? Well, but, um, obviously that's our first task this afternoon, and I've only ever won one championship for Rob before. All the other guys have won lots of championships, so if I can win it, it'll be a special day for me. But after that, we want to win the, the team championship, so I have to keep Didier two places behind me for Dyson to take the team championship from Doran Racing. Will you go flat out those first 90 minutes, or are you going to just make that car last? I'll play it by ear on the first lap, but I, I can see myself just going flat out, to be honest with you. I'll tell you, I've never seen James Weaver lost for words there. We are talking championships on the grid here in Watkins Glen, and for more is my pit partner, Captain Fish. Some of the best battles on the racetrack this year have been in the GTU division, and the number 81 G&W Motorsports Porsche always seems to be in the thick of things. The championship goes down to the wire with the drivers, and their two drivers will decide the outcome here this afternoon at Watkins Glen. Now, Mike Fitzgerald, you didn't share the car with Darren at the Rolex 24 hours, giving you the heads up in the points. He just can't seem to make up that ground on you. Yeah, I know. I, I uh, we've been tied. Or we I'd like it if we were tied, but uh, we're not. So um, you know, if one of us has to be ahead, I guess it's okay. It's me. And Darren, you're going to be starting the car this afternoon, and we're going to see like an AJ Foyt move where you beat Mike out of the car, don't let him back in, so you can get the points and then park the car. That's the plan. I'm going to make sure uh, at the pit stop when he gets in, I'll throw him out of the way, get a little fuel, and and finish my my deal, and it's over. <laughs> okay, well, these boys are going to certainly see a battle this afternoon. Billy Orvalin is in the field driving the number 50 BMW. Thank you, gentlemen. Final race of the season. The championships will be decided today. But this is not the first time this weekend these teams and drivers have raced here at the Glen. Taking back to Friday's qualifying sprint races. That is Craig Conway. 
leaping to the head of the field of the GT class in his American GT car. In GTU, Bill Auberlin and his BMW led Darren Law in the Porsche until Auberlin spun off. Law went on to win the race with the 35 points that go with it. In GTO, Terry Borcheller and Ron Johnson share the lead for the Drivers' Championship. Borcheller picked up the victory in class, but it was the American GT machine of Irv Hare who has already won this season in a sports racer car and on to claim the win in the qualifying race. And with it, the Formix Way Fast Award in the American GT category. Final results, Hare over Borcheller. It was a surprise to see an American GT car beating a GTO. Aaron Law in the GTU Porsche claiming that class victory. And it was time for the Sports Racers and Sports Racer 2 prototype to take to the track. Darkening skies at Watkins Glen. The Hayes of Belgium in the Ferrari chassis with a Judd Formula One derived V10 engine held the lead until James Weaver came flashing forward through the night to take the lead. Now at this point, Several cars went off the track, and it was decided to shorten the sports racer qualifying race. So James Weaver picked up the victory. With it, the Informix Way Fast Award and a couple of precious points toward the Drivers' Championship. Taze finished second, Jack Baldwin third. He and Ralph Kellner still mathematically alive in the Drivers' Championship race in the sports racer class. All of that is now behind us. It's time to strap in multiple drivers in five classes of cars for the revival of the six hours of Watkins Glen. Should be a great race, David. It's going to be absolutely tremendous. There's no doubt about it. This is one of the best racetracks uh, for this type of car. Lots of overtaking opportunities. And of course, the championship very close to the front there. We see Ralph Kilmer in the Ferrari. Uh, that's not quite as quick. It doesn't seem to have quite the power that the uh, Ford and Scott the Ryan Scott cars. And all of the now here you see a great map of the circuit. This is a terrific circuit. They call it 11 turns. But you go down to turn one, which is the bottom left hand of the picture. The S is there, rise up onto that back straightaway, and that's the only place in the world other than the Mans that I've ever done over 200 mile an hour in a sports car before they put that little chicane before the, the end of the track there, the top right now of the picture. At this point, you start going downhill, sweeping through all these corners. The boot is at the bottom right there, very sharp right hand, 180 degree rising corner. Terrific fun. Let's go on board now with Jack Baldwin as we come down to turn one. Great, great of, uh, overtaking opportunity here. Throughout the race, Slow corner. You want to come out of here pretty well though. Use the lower road on the left there. These are the S's coming up. These are very daunting corners, somewhat like a room of Belgium. Very fast right, left, and right hand sweep. And by the time you cross the bridge here, you're already sweeping into top gear and heading up this long, slightly uphill straightaway. As I say, the long hill of the United States, two hundred and eight, two hundred and eight. Before they put the chicane in, like a right. Left, right, this tends to occur of course with the chaos sometimes when people get to stumble over the first lap. Now this long right hander here used to be a very fast corner, not so fast now because it's coming out of chicane, but from here on, he's going downhill. There's a winter cup track to the right here. Down to the tight left hander. He's going to come out of here well because he's got a great opportunity for a person coming up into the boot. Exit here, the raw road, down into the boot. Very, very, very late break here. Right at the bottom here, the road starts to go up here. A bit of an understeering corner, but not very, very careful. Put the power here, get the power on, still going uphill here. A rise in the road here tends to obscure the view for the next right-hander, but this is another good overtaking spot. This is tight right-hander. Coming up the hill here to the uh, left-hander, which leads back onto the Winston Cup track. This one here got adverse counter. The road comes all the way to the right here, so you can understeer there. But you Good run at this one because it's coming into the S and he's going to find it. Very fast left and right hand sweep here to take him back onto the main straightaway. So the front straight one has got to exit this corner really well because this is the end of the year where you're going to be up breaking people into turn one. I mean it was really a tremendous charity track to drive. Great fun. The only downside is you just get a bit bumpy with the loop and get those holes on the surface. <laughs> Go. I remember seeing a film in which Mark Donahue took a Can-Am car around the track of the film camera board. It's in 30 years. The is rolling off. We'll be back with a green flag in a moment.
Grand Am Road Racing is brought to you by Informix Software, Way to Web. And by new 104 Plus Octane Boost with Acceleron Power. Welcome back to the Bosch Summerfest at the Glen. Bob Barsha, David Hobbs with you, John Visignano, and Calvin Fish are in the pit lane. Final weekend of the inaugural Grand American Road Racing Association season. Look at the field. 53 cars strong, looking its way around Blackton's Glen International. Great mix of cars, of course, which is going to make it the jump of the fast guys. But the SRs up the front, the SR2s, and the GTUs are so quick compared to all these GTOs and the ATTs that they, they obviously know it's quick down the straight, but they can be real spoilers around the corner. It's a look at our Informix Way Fast Award winners, victors in Friday night's qualifying races. James Weaver, the Dyson Racing, Riley and Scott Ford, Buddy Rice in his first endurance race, the Atlantic star for TRP Racing, the best sports racer life. Terry Borchiller in GTO in a Celine Mustang, Darren Law in a GW Motorsports GTU, and Irv Hare in his RBO Motorsports American GT Class Chevy Camaro. Now a look at the entire grid help of our Informix starting lineup. On the pole, James Weaver of England, hoping to lock up the Drivers' Championship, but his rival, Didier Tain of Belgium, now living in Phoenix, Arizona, will be right alongside Ferrari Judd. Jack Baldwin and Ralph Kellner, R&S Judd, and a Ferrari Judd, but he's still not going to be alive for the sports racer driver's title down through the rest of the grid. You see John Field, Elliot Forbes Robinson also still have time to be alive in the second Dyson team car. Mario Berto, sports racer Light, he and teammate Ryan Hampton have locked up that driver championship. But keep in mind, these are three classes where two drivers have equal number of points. Today, a very long race, and each driver must drive at least 90 minutes of the six-hour race, or else he will not score points, and that could break some of those ties. Early Navy there, the out of the side, which is, uh, helping out the Conway there in the 09 car. He's been looking strong all season out of Daytona Beach. Bill Orbelin in the 50 car there, way back in the field for him. You have some fast cars toward the back as a result of those qualifying races. Except for the winners of the race, the rest of the grids were set on team owner points. Team owners, one of the unique championships in the Grand Am, will also be decided today. Chevrolet Corvette pace car bringing the field around through turns 10 and 11. And we anticipate the green flag for six hours of racing, the revival of the six hours of the Glen. There are a number of former champions in the field, including, as David mentioned, Hurley Haywood, a nine-time winner here at the Glen. The green flag waves, and we are underway. James Weaver and Didier Tays across the front. It looks like the Ferrari Judd will take the lead into one. David Weaver there was so busy guarding himself, he nearly lost that second place in the Ferrari of Ralph Kellner that's right behind him. It is a very overcast day, no real threat of rain, but it will be cool on the racetrack. That will be good news for the tires. Up through the S's for the first time, Taves leading Weaver. Up that long fairway, Weaver looking to the inside, they come up to the infield loop there, but uh, Didier Taves holds him off. See a lot of concrete patches have been put down on this circuit where the asphalt has been dug up. Down that uh, long right hand downhill corner, terrific, uh, a terrific corner. Tight left hand coming up, that leads to the hole, the crash, and the inside one car, back in 1973 or 4. James Weaver right on top as they come into the boot. Great opportunity, uh, opportunity here for overtaking. Tight rising right hand here. You've got to get the car already set up. It'll understeer a lot going in, but you can flip the tail out to make a good shot down this uh, straight here because otherwise they're going to sneak from the inside and outbreak you with this tight right hand. Pretty bumpy on the approach there. You can see the way those wheels have been locked in from other people as they bounce over some of those bumps. People streaming out now. The uh, big sports race is starting to put out a bit of gap there on the uh, first of the sports race of twos coming up. We've already we see the GTOs, the GTUs and the American GT car there of uh, Herb Hare. Right in. We'll be talking about history. A lot today here at Watkins Glen is Didier Taze of the Phoenix, Arizona area now leads the field across the stripe to complete lap one on this 3.4 mile circuit. Ralph Kellner's in that red from Ferrari 333 SP. An updated technology in sports car racing and it may be the last race for that chassis. Ferrari 333 SP program. 
program has had terrific success in sports car racing in America. It is getting on in years when compared with the new Judd and Ford V8 powered machinery. Jack Baldwin right behind him, the Corbett car, and right behind him is EFR, and the second of the Dyson cars, driven by himself, John Paul Jr., and Dyson himself. Lip through, car off, number 66, one of the GTU machines. That's Kevin Buckler. Now he is mathematically alive for the GTU Drivers' Championship, so this is a terrible break for him. Yes, he was. It was, exactly. Now, disappointing for Kevin Buckler, there's a 04 car coming in too. That car was right at the back of the grid. That's the uh, car of Vic Rice out of San Rafael, California, and Zach Brown. Zach Brown, of course, a uh, former Ford and then a former Atlantic driver. This is a GTO version of the Porsche 911. They got problems at the right rear of that car. And we've got one of the GTU Mazda RX-7s in, the number 44 Rums of Puerto Rico Mazda for Pascasio Aponte, who started the car, sharing with Angel Blanc, both drivers from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Looks like he's either been off or perhaps in conflict with another car. They're going to put the bonnet back on and send him back out. Here's a look at your top 10. We'll be back with more from Watkins Glen. Welcome back. Still in the early laps of the Bosch Summerfest at the Glen. I'm Bob Varshall along with David Hobbs. Didier Tays leads. Let's get to the pit lane and Calvin Fish. James Weaver, who currently sits second, is expected to stay in the car when they make the first round of pit stops. He needs to make 90 minutes in the event this afternoon to score driver points, 25% of the distance. So expect him to stay in the car, try and secure the driver championship this afternoon. The only concern in the number 16 camp is if that left front Goodyear, the 480 compound, will be able to stick up to the very high temperatures and demanding racetrack here this afternoon. Even though it's the hardest compound available, there's a severe load on that left-hand front. And that's the only thing that James Weaver is concerned about with the handling of the car. Well, he's in good hands, racing with Andy Wallace and Butch Leitzinger. There's a look at German Norman Simon, his first appearance of the season. Hybrid racing Ford, Riley, and Scott. We've had a parade of cars visit the pits. Here's John Visignano. Well, the 99 has arrived here in the pits with water spewing all over the back of the engine. They've taken off the engine cover, and they're trying to get that water cap back on. A lot of steam, that's harmless steam, but it's just too hot to deal with. This is something the 99 car did not want to have happen, especially so early on in this race. Thanks, John. Tough break for Martin Snow, Pleasant Grove, Utah, and teammate Larry Schumacher. Six Nissan Lola. It picked up a race victory in the sports racer light category this year. In fact, the only race not won by the team of Larry Alberto and Ryan Hampton out there trying to lock up the championship today. Terrific battle going on here between Ralph Kellners in the 12 car, being followed closely there by Jack Baldwin in the 40 car, and right behind them is the FR. Where that left front they were talking about, that uh, Calvin Fish was talking about, those are sort of corners that just play havoc with that front. There's a tremendous amount of this here. This one obviously, the right front takes a bit of a cane, but not, not, not many left handers on this track. Another one here that's going to take a toll on that, uh, on that left front coming up here, this long rising right hander. Puts a lot of strain on the left front, and of course, obviously, on the left rear too, when you're trying to put the power down, especially there. So, Great. tire conservation. Know, becomes a bit of an issue. Well, as you can see, it's a day. Great example of the mechanical variety of Grand Am open top sports racers. We have the Ferrari V12 against the Judd Formula One derived V10 just behind it. Behind that, big booming Ford V8. As I mentioned this could be the last race for this Recife Competizione Ferrari 333 SP seem to bring enough out of it to compete with Riley and Scott. High downforce chassis with all of the torque and horsepower Ford and Judd engines. Some lap traffic there getting in front of them. Whoa! That's the 17 car, the hybrid car of uh, Simon going over the curb on turn one. Great on board now. Slow traffic through these engines. Very, very fast. Right here, already up to around about 140 miles an hour. Yeah. 
down into the boot. Part of the track we don't get to see very often in international racing. Of course, the Glen, perhaps most famous for its Budweiser and Glen Whistler Cup race. But today we're using the entire international circuit for the Grand Am. Stay with us. Hours of Watkins Glen. Englishman John Wire brought his Laval winning Gulf sponsored GT40 team. And when the dust had cleared, the race was won by a pair of Belgian drivers, Jackie Ix and Lucien Bianchi. Back to live action, that is Martin Snow. We saw him in the pits with steam coming out the back of the car. It seems as though he might have spun in his own fluids. Boy, he obviously tried to go out again, which might have been a bit of a too hard move, actually, because he lost that much water. We saw it losing a tremendous amount of water. And that may be the reason the slow moving Ford Mustang, charityamerica.com, Orion Motorsports Team Chicago Mustang, Kirk Curran, South Deerfield, Massachusetts, sharing with Paul Jenkins and Bruce Nesbitt. That'll bring out our first full course caution of the day. Take it back to that 68 race as we see Irv here at the AGT winning car. Did you win that race in 68? It certainly was. I came second, having been told. Belgian ace win the race. Paul Hawkins in an identical GT40. We led for most of the time, and unfortunately, we were told to slow up and let Jackie X win the race. The work continues on the RVO Motorsports Chevy Camaro. Irv Hare, as I mentioned, started the car after winning the Friday night qualifying race. Roger Schramm and Werner Frank sharing with him. Let's get back down to the pit lane for more of the action. At number 12, Reese Ferrari at 65 miles an hour comes down pit lane. Ralph Kellen is behind the wheel. This will just be for fuel only. They're taking advantage of the full caution period to try and top him up with the fuel, give him a better fuel window. Typically, the Ferrari is in early, is not able to stretch the fuel mileage as far as the Judd, certainly, and sometimes the Ford beat them a little bit, little bit depending on the race circuit configuration. He's topped up the fuel, no tires. Ralph Kellen stays behind the wheel. As you would expect, this yellow flag coming just about seven laps into the race. It's Darren Law in the GTU Championship leading Porsche GT3R. Cal 4 Entertainment, Pure Image. You notice the word spud there on the dashboard as the fueler goes to work. That's a salute to GNW Motorsports teammate Adam Hester from Fort Defiance, Virginia. He suffered severe injuries in an auto accident. That's his high school graduation picture in the lower right part of the screen. Adam, you're looking in, your team is thinking about you. We all wish you the best. One of the most important parts of GT race is to get that screen clean and make it first. Dirty screen, especially for the guy who's going to be racing late in the afternoon. Now let's get more on the race leader situation with John. Well, we checked in with DDA Taze's team, Kevin Doran, the team manager there, and he says the car has developed a little bit of understeer. It's not really a big problem with DDA, but also the wicker bill on the rear wing has come adrift and is sticking out about three inches. There's no way it will come all the way adrift. It's not going to be a danger to the other drivers on the track. They'll have time to correct it during the first normal pit stop, maybe around lap 31. Well, he really wants that rear wicker bill to come off if you've got understeer, because that would certainly cure the understeer. See it to the left side of the rear wing there. Looks like it's just slid along through the channel into which it's fitted. It's just about to pop off the end, although it's pretty secure from here. And as you mentioned, that's not going to do much to help him with that understeer problem. Well, here he's uh, trying to take care of his tires during this course and period, trying to keep some temperature in and also stop that. Green flag coming up. We'll take a quick break and be back for more from the Glen. Welcome back to the Bosch Summerfest at the Glen. Bob Varsha, David Hobbs, Calvin Fish, John Bisignano with you. Signal to Didier Tays in the race leading Doran Judd special. About to get a green flag. Off turn 11, already up to great speed. Green flag waves, we're underway. Looks like James Weaver's gonna take a shot at the race lead as they head down into one and he's got it. Well, here comes Tays back. Wow, big move there by Didier Tays. Hybrid car there in third, this car streaming to turn one, everybody trying to take advantage of course the big Ford engine there of Ben Reeves, he just got an initial jump out of that uh, S curve there under the start of the uh, camp. Now it looks like Norman Simon in that red 
Riley and Scott Chassis with the silver delt on it there is holding up. Here comes Jack Baldwin, followed closely by Elliot Forbes Robinson and looks like John Field also trying to get around. They all did get around to their side and they're going into the loop. Simon hanging on now, still with a strong fast right hand. Now the tires at the moment are going to be pretty twitchy, Bob, because they've all got tire pick up after that caution period there. The tires get hot, they pick up the dust, they pick up the rolled up rubber. So for about a lap or so, he's really got to be careful. And that's where James Weaver certainly seems like the perfect quintessential against him. He speaks very badly, but he's braver than Dick Tracy, I'll tell you, especially <laughs> when he's got, uh, when the tires are uh, they're cold like they are now. Great view of the headlights coming over the brow. This track has a lot of elevation change, like most great road circuits will. A lot of off-camber corners, lots of corners that will catch the car just that little bit, like a bank turn at a speedway. Oh, absolutely. They got this one here, as I said, it's off-camber, so they get right out. You can see the cars going right down to the end. Of the These S's are just like this one. These are so fast. Great corners. This one here, right in the middle, there's a big bump as you exit there. You get blown up to the left hand side of the road there. Terrific race. Absolutely terrific. The name of the headlights on the track tells you it is dark here at Watkins Glen. Quick look at the mirrors. Doesn't get much closer than this. These two men battling for the Drivers' Championship and the Doran team, currently running in second place, had but a six point lead over the Dyson team in the unique Team Owners Championship standings that you'll find only in the Grand Am Series. Now here's another look at the pass for the lead. Good pass there by James Weaver, but uh, Didier Taste thinks at this point he might get it back, and boy, he's right down there almost alongside him. Nearly was in position to get that back, but couldn't quite make it. Now here's Norman Simon bringing in that Riley and Scott Ford for hybrid racing. Looks like they'll make a driver's change. Simon out, Mark Simo will climb in. Getting word there's a problem with one of the corners. There it is, the number 22 sports racer light car for Larry Alberto and Ryan Hampton. This is the championship leading machine. They are not under threat for the driver's championship or the team championship, but they certainly wanted to finish the season. You see all of that contact damage along the right side of the car. Ooh, they got styrofoam up against the guardrail here to stop it going down the car too much. It certainly did a bit there. You can see the styrofoam blowing all over the track. Another great. On board shot now with Jack Baldwin through that loop. This right hander is going to get thwarted here. Very quick for the SR cars through here. He's got some slower cars in front of him. Very well done. Going around the outside there. Inside so, here. Look, those guys see him coming all right. Well, as you can see, he's got a battle on his hands. That's Elliot Forbes Robinson filling up Jack's mirrors in the second Riley and Scott chassis. This is for third overall. Getting back to that styrofoam you mentioned, David, earlier this year when the NASCAR Bush Grand National Series was here at Watkins Glen, that styrofoam got a tremendous workout when a driver named Jimmy Johnson went head on down in turn two and walked away to the pits. The series champions, car number 22, have pulled into the pits. They definitely have had a real shunt right down the side of the styrofoam that protects the drivers. There is some body work damage on the right-hand side that's going to take a little bit of time to fix. I do not see any suspension damage. All the wheels seem to be pointing in the right way, but it is a big problem with the body work. Larry Alberto is in the car. He is absolutely frustrated with himself. They're trying to get this bodywork back on. They have flat spotted several of the tires when the car went off the track and all the brakes were locked up. An extensive stay in the pits for our Sport Racer 2 champions. All right, thank you, John. But I'll bet, judging from the impact, it's glad that styrofoam was there. We'll take a break. Right back. Welcome back to the Bosch Summerfest at the Glen. Final race of the inaugural season of the Grand American Road Racing Championship. Bob Marsh and David Hobbs with you. We are under a full course caution once again. We ride with Jack Baldwin in the Informix, Riley and Scott Judd. And he heads for the pit lane. John Bizzignano will be waiting for him. Baldwin still in the hunt for the championship. Here's Biz. Jack Baldwin brings the number 74 into the stopping area. It will be a full service stop. Jack is getting out of the car. Robinson is getting into the car. 
right now, he was one of the fastest cars on the track in a big battle for third place, moving up on the leaders. The leaders were tearing each other up a little bit, had a lot of traffic. Jack was gaining ground on them right now. All four tires, the Goodyear Eagles are coming off. They are refueling the car. The driver's change seems to be going smoothly. But the longest part of the stop will be the fuel. They want to get back out on the track. Jack Baldwin got some time ahead in third place. Robinson will be able to hold on. All right, thank you, Viz. Jack Baldwin and George Robinson have won together this year. Baldwin also picked up a victory in the Phoenix round, driving with the pair. Huge split from the front of that line is coming back. into these cars as you take a look at the Intersport Racing Lola Judd with Banana Joe's sponsorship in the hands of Oliver Gavin of England who's taken over for John Field from Dublin, Ohio. This is going to be a good car this Lola, there's no doubt about it. It needs some development yet but they've certainly been going very, very well this year. I think they're going to give the riders right Scott a run for their money uh, next year, there's no doubt about it. So there's James Weaver being overtaken at a pretty fair lick by Gavin, the young Englishman. A bit of a surprise. Well, it is a bit. Oliver Gavin, of course, is a Formula One hopeful, or certainly was until not long ago. James has had a few bits. Yes, he is. James Weaver, who's had a taste of the lead in the Dyson, Riley, and Scott Ford, heads for the pit lane. Calvin Fish is there to receive him. James Weaver brings the number 16 car down into pit lane and hits the marks perfectly. He's going to be turning it over now to Butch Leitzinger. The car rolls forward. They hit the jacks. It's up in the air. James has done a superb job out there. Probably been somewhat conservative. He could not afford to get into trouble out there this afternoon. and really uh, affect the driver championship, but the car's in good position to win. He's turning it over to a teammate who he's worked with for many years, Butch Leitzinger. They're now going for the race win. They believe they have the driver's championship in their pocket for James Weaver. He's done 90 minutes in this event and now the task is to win the six hours at the Glen. Stop, as usual for the Dyson team. All right, thanks very much, Galvin. It was interesting to hear James Weaver sputter through his answer when John Bizignano asked him if these guys were going to drive conservatively or aggressively. James Weaver and the man in the car now, Butch Leitzinger, no, no other way to drive. Now let's hear from the man who just climbed out. Back to Calvin. Well, a somewhat tired but very happy James Weaver back behind the pit wall. James, a great opening stint. How conservative did you have to be out there? You needed to get 90 minutes in to clinch this championship, which you've now done. Did that affect your race performance up front? Yeah, Didier was going very well at the start, so I just sort of paced myself along behind him. On the final restart, I thought, I'll see if I can put some manners on him. So it was, but we were very, very close. Tell us about the challenge out there right now. Oliver Gavin is running very strong in the Lola. DDA had a spin. He's back underway. There's over four hours to go in this race yet. Who do you think your biggest challenge is going to come from? It'll definitely be those two judge cars because of the fuel mileage issue. Um, our car's very quick up the straight. They're a little bit quick around the fast corners. But the Riley and Scott is fantastic in traffic. Oliver's really struggling to keep up with me in the traffic. On a clear road, he can catch me. As soon as we hit traffic, um, I can pull away again. Talking of traffic, we saw some slight damage to the right front of the car early in the going. Did you tag someone or did that just come loose? No, I um, caught BMW in the carousel. It was a classic thing. He was still wallowing around on the outside of the road and suddenly woke up and thought, oh, that must be the apex over there and did a 90 right in front of me. Well, Congratul it. Congratulations on the championship. Good luck for the rest of the afternoon. Thanks, Calvin. One of those quaint English expressions. Put some manners on Didier Tays. BMW wallowing around on the outside of the dirt. Typical, uh, typical people. Leitzinger now behind the controls of the car that has taken James Weaver to the Drivers' Championship. Well, that our congratulations, but we've got a long way to go, and that car does not want to go into the afternoon gently, it would appear. We'll take a break and return for more of the Bosch Sports Car Summerfest at the Glen. Oliver Gavin is Leitzinger. Motorsports artist Michael Turner's work adorned the early program for the six hours. In 1971, he showcased the powerful Porsche 917s, but Italy's Andrea Di Adamich and Swedish Lonnie Peterson took the champagne after an upset win in Alfa Romeo. 
Back to the action here at the Bosch Summerfest, taking a look at one of the GTO Porsches. That's the number 25 machine. Being shared this weekend by Mark Montgomery from Daytona Beach, Florida, Court Wagner from Santa Monica, California, and Hubert Hauke from Germany. Hauke, the early leader in the class. The aggressive with all those uh, flares and that big wing at the back. This obviously Charles has led up a lot of downforce and a very quick machine around here on the Glen. That's what you want all the downforce you can get. But of course, at the same time, you need air, aero efficiency of that long straight. That 71 race is another one I should have won, by the way, <laughs> Mark Donahue. We were on the pole and he rocketed up into the lead and about 10 laps in, the steering post broke, turn one and took him off the road. We were out. I don't know what made it, he broke. Good of a moment. Is that a Roger Penske car? Absolutely. The uh, Sunoco Ferrari 512. Great car. Here's a look at Irv Hare, who's done plenty of winning in his time, including two previous victories in this series. One in the sports racer class, co-driving with Jack Baldwin, and one in the American GT class, in which he drives today. Here's how the GTO leading Porsche 911 Turbo. And right behind him is Irv Hare. That first bit of Irv Hare, of course, which is quite amazing. He's turned up until like the day of the race. He comes down here, does a couple of warm-up laps on race morning, and goes wins it with Baldwin. And in between, the motor died. They had to get a replacement Judd V10 in the car, so went out there with virtually no time in an unfamiliar car and went on to win the race, as you mentioned. There's another car that's done a bit of winning over the year. Ron Johnson having taken over from Terry Borchiller. These two men will either share or decide the driver's title between them. They've also clinched the team championship for Celine, Celine Allen team, owned by Steve Celine and television superstar Tim Allen going on with this team. They have a new car coming next year. S7 supercar with Celine Ford Power. Well, you can see what a great field this is. The tremendous melange of cars. Bar the old exhaust pipe on the overrun there. The gas running through the hot exhaust pipe. Very messy at the wheel now. Viper West, Dodge Viper GTS, that has really given the Celine Mustang a run for its money this year. They picked up a victory. He's having to work his way through some traffic there. Also, work his way through the traffic there. Too, very quick. And here come the leaders working their way through that same traffic. Wow, what a exciting uh, track. There's everybody trying to weave their way through with all these incredibly different speeds that these cars can, uh, can control themselves at. Viper on the right. As you can see, the big, powerful, open cockpit sports racer cars. Didier Taze makes his way past George Robinson. Vipers don't give up much. Powerful with the GT class cars. Good look at Taze. Started second, currently running in fourth after his pit stops. He's been in that car for a long time. George Robinson hanging on well as they come out of the S's. More traffic on the front straightaway, weaving through it as they come up to the loop. Robinson hanging on in performance, number 74, Riley and Scott, with the Judd engine. He looked at it again as they come through the traffic. 46 car still belching spray down on every downship. DDA slips through on the way onto turn one, past Robinson. As I said at the beginning, it's a great overtaking spot into turn one. Really good approach. It's more the Formula One service than this shape. You wouldn't need to promote the race. All those tens of thousands of fans who visited this track during the 60s and 70s to so watch Formula One back in a heartbeat. Terrific race here for the GTU lead. There's the number 50 car. And on board now with the uh, Darren Law car running, well, second, but I mean, not a lot in it there. Bill Arberlin up ahead in that BMW M3. Good example here of the mechanical diversity of the Grand Am. A straight six BMW up ahead, racing the flat six traditional Porsche, but not turbocharged in the GTU class. It's a GT3R machine in that yellow and black polka dot style. Very evenly matched. Incredibly evenly matched. Of course, the Porsche with the rear engine, and of course, the BMW, the front engine, rear wheel drive. So, completely different configurations on these cars. As you said, incredibly even Now shifting, running second in the championship, but the championship leader is his teammate. We'll get in the car next. Stay with us. Welcome 
Welcome back to Watkins Glen. Early in the third hour of the six hour race, we have a heavy accident. John Paul Jr. has raced here at the Glen many times. He's hit the guardrail very heavily on his first lap out, having taken over the Dyson Racing Riley and Scott Lincoln for Elliott Forbes Robinson. Poor old John Paul, his career has been so mixed. He was such a good driver, still is a tremendously good driver, but uh, so many of those great drives passed him by and uh, just never ever achieved the fame and fortune that he should have done. You see him walking down the other side of the guardrail. He appears to be just fine. The winner in sports cars and Indy cars. Let's get to the pit lane. Oliver Gavin brings the number 37 Lola into pit lane. It's got that Judd power, gets great fuel mileage. He jumps out, turning it once again to John Fields to take over the driving chores. This team are very fast. John Field is always quick, sometimes a little too hasty, though, in some of his decisions on the track. But they're going to uh, fuel the car up, do a driver change, keep them with the same tires. No tires, that's a surprise. But one thing they've noticed with these Yokohamas is it takes them a long time to get in, come in. So this may be a reason for keeping the tires on the car. Lucky though for these guys that they didn't get Oliver in under green flag. It actually lost radio communication. They wanted him in right before this caution period, so they actually got lucky. So sometimes better to be lucky than good. And uh, Oliver struggling a little bit here. Got a of this is going to be tight. Very tight. There you got the 84 machine right in front of him. Very tight here in pit lane, but John Field gets back underway. Now let's get down the pit lane to John Bisignano. Freddie Leinhardt will take over for TDA Taze, who has been in the number 27 car for the past two and a half hours. Field had gotten the lead, which pushed TDA back to third place for this stop, so they won it very quick. Field has also been in the pits just in front of them and is just out of sight, but right now the driver's change is going on, all four wheels being changed and the fuel is going in as scheduled. Right now they want to make it absolutely paramount that they take some extra time to get all of the grass, a huge amount of grass in the front radiators. They had a problem with that earlier. That's where the temperatures got up, but there is definitely, DDA is telling them to take off the wicker bill, take off the wicker bill, changing the aerodynamics on the back of the car. Freddy's out of here. All right, thank you, John. Now there you see Oliver Gavin out. Let's get back to Calvin. Oliver Gavin now in consultation with Martin Dixon. Martin was actually trying to wave you in there for three laps, Oliver. Seems like you'd lost radio communication. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, the, the radio seems to be playing up a little bit. Uh, and uh, I couldn't hear them. And uh, Martin had said before I got in the car, make sure you look over, over here on top, of the, on top of the fuel tank to see. And uh, it was just as the yellow flag came out that I started, I looked across and there he was, he was going like this. He was so waving it frantically. And so I thought, I better come in. So. You actually got a bit of a break, so you would have stopped under green if you'd seen Martin, believe it or not. Then you got the caution, so obviously things are going your way. How's the car? You kept with the same set of tyres. Are they better the longer they run? Yeah, they seem to be okay. The, the car seems to be getting a little bit loose just on turning, and then from mid to exit, it turned to a bit of an understeer. But really, the car was handling pretty well. We did have the legs on, on, uh, on James, but every single time I got close to him and got to go by him, he was very, very clever in the way he positioned his car on the track. He wasn't, let me say, not dirty at all. He just was, he just was clever. Now there's another of those British euphemisms you like so much. Calvin Fish saying, uh, makes hasty decisions on the track. There are the remains of the number 20, Riley and Scott. Of that accident by John Paul Jr. put us under a full course caution. First lap out, I can only assume either the very cold tires caught him out or something a real came out. Down to the pit lane now. Let's hear from Didier Taze. John Bisignano is with him. Didier Taze, after two and a half hours in the car, you look very fresh. I have to say, as we scored at the moment, the driver's championship is gone, but of course you can still win the team championship. Well, definitely, we have to, uh, to finish behind James uh, to get the title. And uh, that's what we try to do. Um, I think our pace is okay. I just uh, lost some time. I had to stop uh, to clean up the, the radiators because uh, one car uh, didn't see me inside and uh, dive on me on the long sweeper. And I had to put two wheels on the grass to avoid him. And of course, the grass went into the radiator. That's why I had to make an extra stop uh, to, re, uh, to, uh, to clean up the radiator. But otherwise, the car is going well. Are you the fastest car out there when everything's working and you have a clear track? Yes, I think so. At every restart, you know, I, um, you know, when I had a clear lap, I, uh, I pull uh, quite a few seconds on James. 
how's the car? Did the temperatures get to a point where they could have heard anything? Yeah, the, when, when the grass was on the radiator, the temperature came up. That's why I had to stop to clean up. But uh, after that, it was fine. Well, as we saw on John Paul's car, he went around that corner. It did have all four wheels on it, so one can only see the rest of it. Hill is now lined up behind the safety car. John Paul Jr. still shown in sixth. Locked down running order as the race continues. was the year of Ferrari in sports car racing. The program cover at the Glen that year prophesied the six-hour race results as Mario Andretti and Jackie Yates dared to take victory in an classic Ferrari 312P. Back at the Glen, the Bosch Summerfest continues. Butch Leitzinger leading the Jorko Fenford Goodyear sponsors, Riley and Scott Cordier for Dyson Racing. We are back under a green flag. Jack Baldwin lurking on the left end, the 74 car, the Informix, Riley and Scott chassis. GTO battle going on right there as that Porsche 911 Turbo is chased by the Celine Mustang. Jones Field in the low of the chassis came closely followed here by Freddie Leinhardt in the door and Ferrari Judd. It's becoming more important now, and that GTO battle continues. That silver Porsche gets the BASF number five Mustang, and you saw the car shaking. Rattle along. Good on the BASF car. Move down the inside, but side by side. Johnson still behind the wheel, having taken over from Terry Pratchett, who started Celine Allen Speed Lab Mustang by BASF and Home Improvement. It appears that those two men will tie for the GTO Drivers' Championship. The Sabine team will pick up both the team and manufacturer's honors as well. But look at John Field. Boy, he is absolutely there. slicing through the field at the moment. Just taking every opportunity that's presented to him. Got around the 95 car there. That's the TBR, TRV Motorsports, Tom Bob, Gray Card, and Andy Petrie. That's another ride in Scott with Chevrolet in was the pass for the GTO class leadership. Johnson looking underneath the 25 car at every opportunity. Back to the live action. Port Wagner from Santa Monica, California, now behind the wheel of that silver Porsche 911 Turbo. Looks like he wants a piece of Ron Johnson. Here's a look at that sports racer. That is the Porsche Lola. Campaigned by champion Porsche dealer down in Florida. Division's own course is leader on the driver's strength. Right now, currently behind the wheel is Dirk Mueller from Monte Carlo. Watch Port Wagner in that Porsche. Ron Johnson in the number five car seems to put a bit of distance between himself now. Look at that hood oh. there, there, the aerodynamics right as it gets the top speed there. Just starting to make that thing fluff and make a lot of vibration in the car. Around. They call this car Christine because of its devilish nature, perhaps. They have definitely seen the best and worst with that car this year, including several fires. Miller making quick work of the GTO leaders. Had a lot of trouble sorting out the uh, Lotus chassis there with the Porsche engine. The configuration being somewhat different to the Ford and the Judge they've got in those cars, but uh, they obviously getting the thing sorted out pretty well now. The third view of the well, we've got another full course caution. And in the pits, when it comes out, is Butch Leitzinger. It's a tough break for them, getting caught in the pits when the yellow comes out. Here we have a car stopped on course. Leitzinger comes back out. He will have given up the race lead to John Field. Let's get more on the situation in the pit lane now with Calvin Fish. Well, this is a moment that any driver can really do without. Uh, JP returns to pit lane. He's telling Rob Dyson that he basically made a mistake out there on cold tires. The car got loose on him coming out of the tight corner. He overcorrected and put it in the tire wall. So uh, 
These guys have worked together for many years. I'm sure Rob will uh, understand, but uh, very disappointing for JP. He was itching to get out in that 20 car. They thought they had a shot at the win today. Thanks, Calvin. JP, of course, is John Paul Jr. That's him on the left. Bob Dyson didn't appear too upset with his man. Here's the reason for the yellow flag, the GTU Porsche 993 RSR from Autosport South. One of the drivers on this team, interesting, is a fellow named Peter Argetsinger from Weston, Florida. His father Cameron Argetsinger helped design this race track. Family goes way back in these parts. We'll be back. Welcome back to the Bosch Summerfest at the Glen. Bob Barsha, David Hobbs, John Visignano, and Calvin Fish with you. Cars are lined up, ready to go green. Before we do that, there's a note from Calvin. Well, under the caution, this is what you find some of the drivers doing. We've got Oliver Gavin there waving his arms about, telling the stories to the Dyson crew. you got Rob Dyson there sitting on the cooler. James Weaver getting a rub down. Andy Wallace hasn't gone to work yet this afternoon. But you've got three Englishmen probably discussing the weather and uh, probably discussing what's going to happen in the remaining three and a half hours of this one. Plenty of feud on hand and uh, getting a nice rub down there for James. So everything's cool down here in pit lane as we speak. All right, thank you, Calvin. Andy Wallace looking particularly uninterested in what's going on around <laughs> The field is formed up. We anticipate the green flag, and it waves. John Field, right of the track, leading. Leinhardt coming along, and then it looks like Butch Leitzinger off to the left, also making a great charge in the number 16 Dyson car. Watch out, Freddy. Hanging in there, the hybrid car, the number 17. Yellow car is the TRB Motorsport Wiley and Scott Chevrolet from Tom Fulton, Ray Carter, and Andy Petery. Yet another example of a different engine chassis combination in the Granddad. Leitzinger looking down the inside of Leinhardt makes pretty quick work of him into the inner loop. Boy, that car of Leinhardt is lively. Uh, Leitzinger is pretty lively there, isn't it? He goes through that loop. We saw it just after he took over from James Weaver earlier. We saw it snapping around a little bit. Down the afternoon drive for me. Line hard dropping back just a little bit there. They go into the bottom part of the track here, down this pretty steep hill down here, and hard brake at the bottom. And as you're under the brakes, the car starts to go uphill, so it's a tremendous load again, as we said before, on that left front. Wow, the car still sinking. Tired, obviously, not up to temperature. Have a look at the pass. You got Wallace, Weaver, and Leipzig. I mean, boy, oh boy, that would be a combination to make your heart sink if you're driving any of those other cars. You know, Freddie Leinhardt with the best one in the world. Certainly not as quick a driver. That's what you need to I mean, That's what you need. You need to get good teams together to make such an incredible team. Look there at the number 11 American GT Chevy Camaro. The Levy Hamilton Safe Team. Chevy Levy from Miami, Florida, now in control. Sharing with Kenny Buff and Doug Mills. Now Mills from Hagerstown, Maryland, came into today's race with a one-point lead for the American GT West Drivers' Championship. He got that because of the problems suffered by his rivals for that title, notably Andy McNeil, whose car broke during the race, as did the machine of Craig Conway and Doug Goad, who were also in the running for the driver's title. So suddenly, some hard driving of his own. Doug Mills finds himself with a one-point lead in the championship as the race goes on. There is Andy McNeil. He came into this weekend with the lead in the championship. Now he finds himself having some work to do. As you saw, 29th overall, fourth in the class in the 84 car. His light singer still slashed his way through the field. In fact, slashed his way past John Field. Have a change in race leadership. Butch Leitzinger takes over from John Field. The little winglet on the left front there has been tagged on something. You can see it coming off, so he's lost a bit of his downforce there. All right, here's a look at the pass. Wow, a great move there. He drafted it through the S's, which of course with his high downforce cars is difficult because when you get too close to the car in front, you tend to lose downforce in the top circle. Well, Leitzinger just stuck right in there behind Field. Very fast, actually. Up from behind him. I'm wondering if that's where that left front end plate 
it got bent. No, I think it's been bent for a couple of laps now, but it doesn't seem to be affecting its performance much, <laughs> to say the least. Now traffic. 95 cars, sort of cars are going to be difficult to overtake. There's another ride in Scott Tim. So it's not right behind. That's another ride in Scott Chassis with Chevrolet engine. John Field hanging on well to the boot. Also getting close underneath the ring of Fritz Leipzig. Leipzig are not giving many room there. Still remains in the race lead. The field right there, a car length between them. We'll be right back. Back at Watkins Glen, David Hobbs, Bob Varshu with you. Something very unusual going on there at the pit out. This is the number 11 car that figures in the American GT Class Championship. Doug Mills on that driver's strength. And right there is the number 66 Porsche, being driven by Philip Collin. We are on board now with John. Now he has come into that uh, one. Ooh! Oh, I see that one happened. And then he bumped into pit out. So he was lapping him, and then he went around the other side of 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 the now, Ryan Hampton, who will share the driver's title with Oberto, is behind the wheel. Let's get more on that situation now with Calvin Fish down in the pit lane. Mikey did a lot of work to get the number 22 car back on track. Tell us about the damage and what sort of shape is it in now? The damage really wasn't that bad, just an upper control arm and a rear wing. The tough part was that the end cover of the, of the gearbox was broken. We had to put it on, it's a, basically the bearing here, so we had to rebuild the whole rear end. It probably would have been a 20 minute job, and since we had to rebuild the gearbox, that's what took our time. Right now our main goal is just making sure we get our drivers their points. We got the championship locked up, so we might actually bring Ryan in early. So Ryan and Larry don't both get points, just to make sure we continue. We want co-champions, we've been trying it all year, and that's what we're going for now. Well, if they do bring Ryan Hampton in early, Macy from Toronto, Canada will take over the car. They've done a great job all year long. The Archangel Motorsports team, as you just heard, has picked up the team title as well as the Drivers' Championship. Meanwhile, back up front, Cat and Mouse Jane continues between Butch Leitzinger and John Field. Going up into the fast part of the track here, the S's getting behind some lap track, that's the number 91 car. Giving them plenty of room there as they exit this uh, very fast set of S's. And here goes the oh, Field down the inside and motors right by Leitzinger. Holds that lead into the inner loop. He is really thrashing that car. Oh, nice to drive there by John Field. Certainly uh, the S's. Leitzinger lifted off enough just to give him that little bit of momentum as he came out of the corner onto the straight. To be able to draw away fairly easily from Leitzinger as well. Look at those silver accent stripes to the car. It makes it look a bit like a Batmobile in the front end. Here's another look. Oh, maybe this is why Leitzinger lifted. Uh -huh. A local yellow flag. Oh. Freddie Leinhardt down there on the oh, video Taser car. There goes the hopes of the team championship then. Absolutely dusted up. So Leinhardt spun there. Looks like he had contact with another car. And it looks pretty damaged to me. The grass and the radiator there, the front of the flow. Bit of a tire kiss just behind that left front wheel yeah. well. Slip that white horse that we saw. I think that was the Ford All Motorsports number 18 GTU car. Kipper Hiskey and Randy Coates. Life could have dealt a better pack of cards. So there he goes by. So I guess the uh, field got the message that he was passed under the yellow. So he left the lights in the back through it. Nope, 
Walmart and the 18 car for that matter remains stationary. It is now a full course caution. We'll take a break and return to Watkins Glen in just a moment. Back at Watkins Glen, pit stop for the race leader Butch Leitzinger who will climb out and turn the car over to Andy Wallace. Leitzinger to Wallace, I mean everybody else, like I said before, the heart must be in the boots because I mean all three of the boots are absolutely Earlier in the program we talked about Hurley Haywood and his success at the big three of the World Endurance Classics, Daytona, Le Mans, and Sebring. Andy Wallace is another man who has won all three. Including his very first trip to the So casual so about it, yeah, well, you go there to win, don't you? This is the 27 car for Freddie Leinhardt that Didier Taves had pinned his hopes of overcoming James Weaver for the championship on. Looks like the damage is even more severe than we thought. He slipped out of the car and then backs into the guardrail, so we've got damage all over the place here. It's a that rim. It's real hard enough to bend the rim like that. Very good chance to bend some of the suspension. Obviously, the rear bodywork is the chain. Does not. While back on track, any bump, oh, he's got problems. Now this could be important. This is one of the AGT cars, and Doug Mills pretty much has to get to the end of this race in this car to have any hope of taking the American GT Class Drivers Championship. Of course, losing that hood doesn't help you down force and your aerodynamics one bit. And of course, aerodynamics at this track are very important for the down force and for straight line speed. Still have a long way to go in this race. Now in the sports racer lights category, this is Ralph Thomas, who has not seen a lot of action in the series this year. But he's driving that Trent Shoring Services Mazda-powered kudzu chassis with a couple of guys who do, Dennis Spencer and Rich Grupp, who have driven the car all year long. Running as the sister chassis of the number 63 Mazda kudzu, the shops of Jim Downing, who built the car. Now, Looks like the problem is even more severe than we thought. The number 27 is pushed away. John Bisignano is standing by with Kevin Doran. Kevin, the team's packing up, and unfortunately it's a little bit early, but you've had a great, great season. Yeah, we've had a good season. Um, you know, Freddie at List has given us a good car and given us the opportunity to run for the championship with uh, the List of sponsorship. And we've got two wins, and um, looked like we had a win maybe, you know, here. Uh, had a shot at it anyway, and we were leading the championship coming into today, but now we're going to drop back several spots, so championship's gone, but it's been a great year. I, I don't know. We've got a bunch of seconds and a bunch of thirds, and uh, great run at Elkhart Lake. It was a lot of fun. Looking forward to year 2001. What are the plans? Well, 2001, uh, actually, uh, 2001 just got resolved this weekend while we were here at the track. Last night, we... Uh, we bought a new Max Crawford car from right here in Charlotte, North Carolina, you know, U.S. built car. And uh, I look for good things out of that. Uh, Max is a good man. He's, uh, he's done a real good job at sports cars for a long time. So I think it'll be a good car for us next season. They'll be back, Daytona, 24 hours, February 2001. Probably the same driver lineup, brand new chassis. Thanks, John, and I think they won't be the only team using that new car. Now, Calvin. The number 25 Porsche that had been putting up such a great run this afternoon in the GTO battle. Looks like their day is done. We're seeing a telltale sign of some smoke from the rear end of the car. The engineers and mechanics are looking underneath. It's Court Wagner behind the wheel right now. He won the Porsche Cup last year. He's had a lot of success, obviously, with the Porsches over the years. We're going to try and get a word with him. Court, what happened? Well, I'm not really sure, Rob. It was a great restart. We were catching the uh, Saline Viper at uh, the Saline Mustang at a pretty good clip, and all of a sudden uh, the motor sounded uh, very terminal. So I flipped it off very quickly. I'm not sure if we had mechanical or not exactly sure what happened at this point, but I think we're out of the game. Okay, looks like their day is done, guys. They're still uh, searching under the back end, but uh, Telltale rattle when he fired it back up. That's a shame. That team has come a long way to compete here at the Glen. That's the Rook Racing DM Motorsports Porsche 911 Turbo. Goes with a lot of success in the European GT circuit. On board with Kenny Buff, missing the engine cover. 
on that number 11 American GT Chevrolet Camaro to feature in the championship as the race leaders go flashing by. We'll be back to the Glen. of the 1973 Six Hours program featured the French Matra, a car as well known for its sound as its speed. The duo of Gerard LaRousse and Henri Pescarolo teamed up for the first of two straight wins at the Glen, 73 and 74. Back at the Bosch Summerfest, this is not good news for Doug Mills. His car is sitting in the pits. Let's get more now from Calvin Fish. The car 11 machine in the American GT category is in the pits right now, and this really has some uh, effect on the championship. If Doug Mills loses the lead here, there's a chance they may lose the championship to Conway and Gold. So looks like a routine stop. The fuel is going in the rear end. There's a lot of smoke down here on the left corner. Looks like there's a bit of a leak, and I'm not sure if it's coming from the brakes or whether some fluid is getting in there onto the rotor, but a lot of smoke coming out of the left front. The car has uh, had some problems. We can see the hood is missing, and the uh, car is really running not in good aerodynamic trim, but uh, they're going to try and get it refired, get it back underway and score some points and maybe the championship. Thanks, Calvin. There is the reason. There is the 09 being shared by Craig Conway and Doug Goad, the two men that Calvin was just talking about, are now in the lead in American GT. Ironically, they should be leading this driver championship by a lot more but a strategic miscalculation at the line rock round, which they won, resulted in them scoring no points at all. It's a very complicated story. The fact is, we have a great American GT drivers battle going on right now. The 11 is now back on course. Darren Law, the GTU class leading portion, number 81. Looks like we have a driver change coming up. I should point out that the other driver in that battle for the American GT class lead, Andy McNeil's car, has gone behind the wall for differential change. But his championship hopes, it would appear, have evaporated. didn't sound quite right. It didn't sound like the typical Porsche burglars and hiders. Fitzgerald goes back behind the wheel and as things currently stand, Mike Fitzgerald will be the GTU driver's champion this first season of the Grand Am Championship. Meanwhile, great battle going on here. That's Jack Baldwin in the number 74 car. This is for second place. Now, he is out there in front of Oliver Gavin, who fell back when John Field hitted that car to put Gavin behind the wheel. And now the young Englishman, it appears, will take over second place. This will be wheel to wheel down into one. darker all the time as we get further into this six-hour battle. The revival, the six hours of Watkins Glen, the third of three events returning to sports car glory in the Grand Am season. First is the Paul Revere 250 on the July 4th weekend. The second is the Road America 500 miler. And today, six hours at the Glen. Here's your top ten. We'll take a break and return. Welcome back to Watkins Glen. Bob Marsha, David Hobbs, John Bisignano, and Calvin Fish with you. You're watching Andy Wallace, the race leader. As this race gets into its late stages. Through the inner loop, plunging downhill. Fast right hand. Very fast. Little rise up then. Then more downhill. This is the downhill left hand.
on. Rob Dyson puts lights in the middle and James Weaver on the right. Maybe a little premature to celebrate that championship, even though it is firmly in Weaver's grasp. 22 card, Ryan Hamilton. <laughs> That's the crew chief, Pat Smith, who calls all the shots for the team. Weaver maybe just not quite sure. Wallace Soldier's on, headlights gleaming on the fast back straight away into the inner loop. Macy in the Oberto car, 22 Sports Racer Light category leader. Wallace having to be very careful here as he moves by the GTO BASF Celine Mustang. Coming up now on that Viper that has given Mustang such a tussle this year. car and the shadow. Jackie Oliver spent a lot of time on that machine. For number 84, that's Andy McNeil's Chevrolet Camaro. But well back in the field, now back on track after some drivetrain repairs. Andy Wallace continues on his way, flashing past the slower traffic. It's more climbing the hill to rejoin at the point where the NASCAR Winston Cuppers race the short course here at Watkins Glen. Of course, that first six hour I did, of course, only used the short course. A very quick race that way. We'll be back to the Glen. Back at Watkins Glen in the very late stages of the Bosch Sports Car Summerfest and problems for the number 12 Risi Competizione Ferrari. Been in the top five all day. Moments ago, Belgian Eric Vanderpool took the car on track, having just taken over, but immediately suffered a fire in the engine compartment. See, Vanderpool remains in the car. This would be a very ignominious finish to this car's career, if that is the case. Now we've got problems on track now. Number zero, Porsche 911 GT2. This is a GTO class car. David Lacey, Greg Wilkins, and Peter Zadka winner of the GTO class in surprising fashion in Mid-Ohio earlier this year. It appears he has had a big accident. Boy, I'll tell you what, he spread some debris on the track there. It looks like he's going to bring out another full course caution. And at very close to the end of this race, this might well cause this event to end under caution. A lot of debris on the track. Sandy Wallace continues in the race lead for Dyson Racing. Yes, white flag is out. This, of course, is a timed race, so you never know exactly when the checkers will fall. We now have word that this is the final lap. The Dyson team has clinched the team championship along with the driver's championship. 
for James Weaver. There is Weaver. Hugs all around. Kisses where appropriate. Be outdone by his longtime boss, boy Rob Dyson and James Weaver have been together a long, long time. Remember James Weaver coming to the Glen? Now he's driving in GTP when he was just a lad. He was asking about racing around like Mr. Holtz. Then he went on to conquer America. Oh, we see lots of flags out there now, including the red and yellow striped oil flag. It appears this race will end under caution, and that's a bit of a shame because it's been a great battle. Lots of passing, lots of terrific speed differentials, dicey moves by great drivers. Great overtaking we've seen this afternoon. Some pretty hairy stuff, too. Some guys that have really stuck their noses in where maybe they shouldn't have done but got away with it. But a lot of caution, too. Andy Wallace will have the honor of bringing the car under the checkered flag to clinch the first ever Grand American Road Racing Association Championship for Dyson Racing and James Weaver. We have a lot of championships decided up and down the pit lane. We'll take some time to explain them all to you in just a moment. But for now, this race is about to be concluded. As you say, it's always a shame when a race finishes under caution as he goes through those S's. Normally going through there at about 125. Now he's going more like uh, 45 or 50. Here's the checkered flag out for Andy Wallace. Well, at least everybody gets to be in the picture at the finish. Off to the left there, you see the black polka dotted Porsche. It would be Mike Fitzgerald celebrating the championship that he has won with the G&W team. Bob Dyson is out on the wall. Bob Dyson was one of the founders of the Grand American Road Racing Association, a great believer in its philosophy of affordable sports car racing mentioned earlier, his crew chief, Pat Smith, calls the shots. In fact, Rob says, hey, I may be the car owner, but I do whatever Pat tells me to do on a race weekend. The result, another championship for Dyson Racing. Let's hear from Pat Smith now, standing by in the pit lane with Calvin Fish. Team manager Pat Smith, you had a lot going on there this afternoon. The 20 car went out early, but James clinched the championship. Then you got the team championship and finally the win. Great day. Yeah, there was a lot of gambling going on, but we made it. We pulled it off. Tell us about the year. I mean, it's been an up and down year. I mean, you took off, you won Daytona, you didn't win overall, but you got the uh, SR win, and that was important, got you some points on the board. But uh, you had a lot of challenges this year from the Ferrari and the Lister. Uh, we had some challenges, and we had a bit of uh, hired luck on our car. Some bits fell off that shouldn't have, but uh, yeah, we've been a good year all in all. It's been great to watch. Congratulations. Thanks. Congratulations indeed. Thank you, Calvin. And team manager has a better ring to it than Gucci. In fact, he's not the crew chief, which is why he's so willing to admit that some things fell off the car at the Rolex that shouldn't have. Andy Wallace will make his victory lap and then bring it into victory lane, where we will line up the champions and speak with them. Yet again, Ali Wall Andy Wallace wins an enormous race. He goes down over six hour race and he's going to come back. Andy, definitely one of your team when it comes to the George race. Back at Watkins Glen, Andy Wallace pulls the number 16. Norcold, Dyson Racing, Riley and Scott Ford into victory lane. He will climb out, having, as you mentioned, David, achieved yet another victory in a debut race. Yes, he's uncanny. He's pretty happy about that. He put in a lot of miles there. Had a lot of traffic at the end there, too, Andy. He did the job keep himself out of trouble. Congratulations from his car owner. Hard fought six hours. The revival of the six hours of Watkins Glen went off without a hitch. Congratulations from James Weaver as well. Together with Butch Leitzinger, they pick up the victory as five sports racers fill the top five positions. Down there in the sixth spot, you see Darren Law and Mike Fitzgerald in their GTU Porsche beating the GTO and American GT cars. That's a bit of a surprise. Tremendous run from that car. In the 18th spot, there is Doug Mills, who will win the first ever Grand Am American GT Drivers Championship. There is the Porsche Lola in the 21st spot. Down in 30th spot, Andy McNeil, who led the American GT Championship coming into this race, but will not take the title. Ryan Hampton and Larry Oberto in the number 38 spot will share the championship 
in the Sports Racer 2 category. Down in 43rd spot is Diddy A.K. and Freddie Leinhardt. Bentley is close to at that fifth track. Now we'll let the celebrations and the interviews begin. Here's Calvin. Andy Wallace pulls in a victory lane, another classic endurance event under your belt, Andy. What a race for you guys this afternoon. Well, it was a fantastic race, as you say. Uh, I've got a great team behind me, and that's how I can be here in the first place. I've got two great teammates, and I'm so glad I came to this race. It's wonderful. This is one of the races of all these 24, 12, 8,000 miles that I haven't won. So now I've won a six-hour race. I'm very, very happy. Thank you. Great job this afternoon. And Rob Dyson, you've got to be ecstatic. I mean, winning the Drivers' Championship and now the Team Championship as well for Dyson Racing. Just a little bit warm. Awesome. Pretty impressive. You know, you take every win you can, and uh, the guys did a terrific job. I know. He said that and clearly, you know, uh, Butch and Andy supplemented all of James's effort and talent throughout the whole year. Actually, throughout 14 years that James has been with us. So it's an honor to be with these guys. It's an honor to compete with them. It's an honor to compete as a part of their group and having them be a part of our effort. And so uh, it's, it, i got to admit, I'm pretty full. It's impressive. As they say, as always a team ever, we're going to try and grab James here. James, congratulations. Another Drivers' Championship means a lot to you, I'm sure. 14 years with Dyson Racing to win for them. Well, yeah, actually, funny enough, it's always Butch and uh, EFR win the championship, so the governor was starting <laughs> to get a little bit suspicious. So I'm glad I finally managed to win one. Well, superb performance today. Good to get that double stint early, get your 25%, 90 minutes, and uh, the boys brought it home for you. Yeah, that was great, because I, I enjoyed the start of the race, and I could just sit back and enjoy the rest of it. Couldn't have worked out better. All right, mate, great season. Thank you very much. Congratulations indeed. Here's a look at the final sports racer category championship. James Weaver with the title by 30 points over Didier Taze. And such a disappointing day today after a great drive. Jack Baldwin finishes in third, Muskia Torella fourth, and Elliot Ford Robinson in fifth. Ron Johnson, you just said you can't win them all, but you won most of them. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a great year for us in this uh, championship season. The uh, BASF Celine SR has just been a, been a phenomenal car year. I mean, we've had a little problems here and there, but the crew's just been awesome getting it back together. And, and we went out there today, and we, uh, we got a little, uh, you know, a little bad luck there with the last yellow, and uh, one of the GTU cars snuck around in front of the uh, leader and got a lap on us. So we finished second in GT, but we won GTO, which is what we're here to do. Terry Barcheller, when you saw the car in flames at Elkhart Lake, did you think you'd be standing here as a champion? Well, that uh, watching that was that was uh, a heartache for sure because you see it burn into the ground and you think, man, I don't I, I don't know what we're going to do. We only got one car, and uh, I'm I'm real happy that we're able to finish the season out and win the championship. Ron did a great job today. Congratulations, you both deserve this championship. The whole team deserves this championship. Yeah, they did great all year. Thanks. Ron Johnson and Terry Borcheller, congratulations to them and the Celine Allen Speed Lab team for sweeping the GTO category. There's a look at all of the team champions in each of the five categories of today's race. Now let's meet our driver's champion in the GTU class. It was a battle of teammates. Here's Calvin. Well, Darren Law and Mike Fitzgerald celebrate together here in Victory Lane. Darren. A little frustrating, I'm sure, to see you not clinch the Drivers' Championship, but you guys put on such a performance yeah. this year. It had to be fun. Yeah, well, I mean, we knew the whole deal all season long. So it's, uh, it's great. It's storybook season for us. Podium almost every race. I um, can't say enough for G&W. Mike, you had to be a little apprehensive when Darren got his time in, and then you had to still bring it home. But uh, <laughs> you did that successfully. Another win today, adding to the tally for the year. And uh, that Porsche Cup still looms. You could clinch that this year as well. Uh, that would be great, but uh, I'm not going to count that one yet. Uh, I want to just uh, thank my co-driver, Darren Law. He was awesome all year. Um, the uh, the G&W guys did a great job. Car ran well, and uh, you know, we won another one. I can't believe it. Well, it was a great battle today, and we enjoyed it all season long. Congratulations. All right, let's bring up all right, thank place. you, Calvin. Congratulations indeed to Mike Fitzgerald. The Porsche Cup he referred to as the worldwide Porsche Cup, offered by the Porsche factory to its most successful driver around the world. Here's a look at all of our driver's champions. Ryan Hampton and Larry Oberto share that title in Sports Racer Light, as do Terry Porcheller and Ron Johnson in GTO. Here's John. Doug Mills, congratulations. We understand that you are the AGT champion. What a great season. It was a wonderful season. I had an opportunity to work with a lot of tremendous people to get here. Uh, I actually won this championship today, and this was my third team this year in the AGT series. 
and I thank all of those folks for being a part of it. What about watching that car at the last few laps going around, no hood on it, no aerodynamics, you must have been holding your breath every lap. I had more butterflies watching the car in the last 35 minutes than I do uh, at the beginning of the race. But well, congratulations on a great season and to all the teams that put you as a champion. Thank you very much. Doug Mills wins perhaps the hardest fought championship of the season in American GT. While the Celine crew enjoys the spoils of their sweep, we'll be back. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you. Grand Am Road Racing is brought to you by Informant Software, Way to Web. And by the U.S. Army. Be a part of the toughest, smartest army in the world. Be all you can be. Back at Watkins Glen, up on the podium, a plethora of champions. As we wind up this inaugural season of the Grand Am, back to victory lane. Doug Goad, once again, you bring the spirit of Daytona back into the victory circle where it belongs. What a great season you've had. Also, congratulations on winning the team championship. Thanks, John. It, uh, it was a really good job by the team. The team. Spirit of Daytona guys did a great job the whole season. We had little foibles here and there, but nothing major. And today the car was just great. We lost our power steering with about uh, an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes to go. Other than that, the car is absolutely perfect. I want to thank X1R, um, Craig for uh, putting the program together, Todd, Troy, the whole team. It was just a fantastic day. Craig, let's ask you about that program. You went to the 24 hours of Daytona and you said this is fun, we can win this thing. And here you are in the victory circle and you stand here as a team champion. Right, it's great. It's been an excellent year. Six wins, I mean, that's, that's more than we hope for. It's been great. Uh, the team has worked so hard all year. And Doug has been a great co-driver. Also, uh, we've got some help from X1R, which uh, has saved us a few times. Red Lane Oil, we're real thankful for that. But, uh, I mean, just a great year. Please tell us you'll be back next year for a full run. We're working on it. We're looking uh, for a corporate partner <laughs> to uh, assist us in that. But uh, we're trying to put that together for next year, yes. Congratulations. You guys deserve this championship. Thanks, John. They are a great story. Ran the 24 hours, didn't intend to run the series. Here they are as team champions. Here's a look at the manufacturer's champions in this inaugural season of the Grand American Road Racing Championship. Let's get back to John. Dennis Spencer, you spent most of the time in the car. You had some great co-drivers, but you brought the car home in Victory Circle here at Watkins Glen. Congratulations. Thank you. That was the uh, first stint was out was a little over two hours. It was great. And then we did the last stint, bringing it back in again. And this is endurance racing. That's the one thing that we have over the other teams is the gray hair and the endurance racing capability. Well, congratulations to Rich Grump and Ralph Thomas also. Thanks, John. And with today's race, we come to an end of this inaugural season of the Grand American Road Racing Association season. Great season it was. David Hobbs, your final thoughts. Well, certainly today was tremendous for the Dyson team. Terribly disappointed for Diddy A.K. and must have been very disappointed also for Rob, uh, Conway and Doe, too, I think. And as you heard Kevin Doran say, they will be back with a new car next year, ready to do it all over again. And it starts, of course, with one of the biggest sports car races in the world, the Rolex 24 at Daytona, coming your way here on Speed Vision, as will the entire Grand Am season. I'm Bob Varsha for David Hobbs, Calvin Fish, John Bisignano, and also for Sandy Hang, who patrolled the pit lane for much of the season this year. Thanks for being with us every step of the way. We'll see you next year. Until then, so long, everyone.